Hello detectives! It's the most exciting part of your day! I'm so excited to continue in this mystery story with each of you. There are so many mysterious and unanswered questions in our mystery so far. For example, who was Flora's mysterious daughter and how did she disappear? Was the accident in the coffee shop really a bomb? Or was it just an unfortunate accident? Why was Mr. Who so delighted about the explosion in the coffee shop? How is it possible that George Theodorkis was seen in an old photograph with Sam Westing's deceased daughter, Violet? Oh, there are so many unanswered questions and mysterious things in this story. Let's dig in and continue reading in our mystery. I'm going to pull up the text on the screen and you can follow along as I read it aloud. Chapter 13, The Second Bomb. No one was in the kitchen of Shin Hu's restaurant when the bomber set a tall can labeled monosodium glutamate behind similar cans on a shelf. The color-striped candle would burn down to the fuse at 6.30. Whoever was working there would be on the other end of the room, and no one would be hurt. Due to the unfortunate damage to the coffee shop, Shin Hu's restaurant is prepared to satisfy all dinner accommodations. Order down or right up to the fifth floor. Treat your taste buds to a scrumptious meal while feasting your eyes on the stunning snowscape before it melts away. Reasonable prices, too. Grace Wexler tacked her sign to the elevator wall as she rode up to her new job. She was going to be the seating hostess. Where's the cook? Mr. Who shouted, meaning his wife. He found Madame Who in their rear fourth floor apartment, kneeling before her bamboo trunk, fingering mementos from her childhood in China. He hurried her up to the kitchen, too harried to find the words that would explain what was happening. Now where was that lazy son of his? Doug jogged in from a tiring workout on the stairs. How was he supposed to know the restaurant would open early? Nobody bothered telling him. Some student you are. Anyone with the brain of an anteater could have figured that out. People are short of food. The coffee shop is closed for repairs. Stop arguing. Go take a shower and put on your bus busboy outfit. Get going. Don't you think you're rather hard on the boy? Grace commented. Well, somebody's got to give him a shove. If he had his way, he'd do nothing but run. Who replied between bites of chocolate? And you're not so easy on Angela either. Angela? Angela was born good, the perfect child. As for the other one, well, well, it's not easy being a parent, Who said woefully. You can say that again. Grace held her breath. Her husband would have done just that, said it again. But Mr. Who only nodded and shared sympathy. What a gentleman. Only Mr. and Mrs. Theodoricus ordered down. The other tenants of Sunset Towers lined up at the reservation's desk, waiting for Grace Windsor Wexler to lead the way. Oversized menus clutched in her arms, Grace felt the first proud stirrings of power rush up from her pedicured toes to the very top curl on her head. If Uncle Sam could pair off people, so could she. You see your brother every day, Chris. How about eating with someone else for a change? She wheeled the boy to a window table without waiting for an answer. It would have been yes. The two cripples together, Sidel Pulaski thought. She'd show that high and mighty hostess. She'd show them all. She and Chris could have private jokes too, and everybody would be sorry that they weren't sitting with them. What's mogugim? Chris asked, baffled by the strange words on the menu. I think it's boiled grasshopper. Sidel screwed up her face and Chris laughed or chocolate covered mousse. French fry mouse, Chris offered. Now Sidel laughed and they both laughed heartily, but no one envied them. Your brother seems to be enjoying Miss Pulaski. Theo nodded, awed by the beautiful Angela, three years older than he, so fair skinned and blonde, so unattainable. Here he was, sitting at the very same table with her, just the two of them, and he couldn't think of a single thing to say that wasn't stupid, or childish, or childishly stupid. Usually the quiet one, Angela tried again. 
Are you planning to go to college next year? Theo nodded, then shook his head. Say something, idiot. I got a scholarship to Madison, but I'm not going. I'm going to work instead. What big, worried, sky-blue eyes. The operation for Chris, it'll be very expensive. Ugh, that was worse. She was feeling sorry for him. If Chris had been born that way, maybe it wouldn't be so bad. But he was a perfectly normal kid, a great kid. And he's smart, too. About four years ago, he started to get clumsy. Just little things at first. Well, perhaps my fiancé can help. Angela bit her lip. Theo was not asking for charity. And fiancé, what an old-fashioned silly word. I went to college for a year. I wanted to be a doctor, but, well, we don't have as much money as my mother pretends. Dad said he could manage if that's what I really wanted, but my mother said it was too difficult for a woman to get into medical school. Why was she gabbing on like this? I want to be a writer, Theo said. That really sounded like kid stuff. Would you go back to college if you won the inheritance? Angela looked down. It was a question she did not want to answer, or could not answer. Long before becoming a judge, Josie Jo Ford had decided to stop smiling. Smiling without good reason was demeaning. A serious face put the smiler on the defensive. A rare smile put a nervous witness at ease. She now bestowed one of her rare smiles on the dressmaker. I'm so glad we have this chance to become acquainted, Miss Bombach. I had so little time to chat with my guests last night. It was a wonderful party. Flora Bombach appeared even smaller and rounder than she was as she sat twisting her napkin with her hands, accustomed to being busy. Was her face permanently creased from years of pleasing customers, or was a tragedy lurking behind that grin? Have you always specialized in wedding gowns? Mr. Bombach and I had a shop for many years. Bombach's for the bride and groom. Perhaps you've heard of it. I'm afraid not. The judge would have said no in any case to keep her witness talking. Perhaps you've heard of Flora's bridal gowns. That's what I called my shop after my husband left. I don't know much about groom's clothes. They're mostly rentals anyway. Flora Bongbok lost her timidity. The judge let her chat away. I'm using heirloom lace on the bodice of Angela's gown. It's been in my family for three generations. I wore it at my wedding and I dreamed that someday I'd have a daughter who would wear it too. But Rosalie didn't come along until I was in my 40s, and the dressmaker stopped. Her lips tightened into an even wider grin. Well, Angela will make such a beautiful bride. Funny how she reminds me of her. Angela reminds you of your daughter, the judge asked. Oh, my, no. Angela reminds me of another young girl that I made a wedding dress for. Violet Westing. The heavy charms on Sidel Pulaski's bracelet clinked and clunked as she raised a full fork and flourished in a practice ritual before aiming it at her open mouth. Chris's movements were even jerkier. She's a good person, he thought, but she thinks too much about herself. Maybe she never had anybody to love. Here, let me help you to some of this delicious sweet and sour ostrich. Their laughter drowned out the loud groan from another table where Turtle sat alone. A transistor radio plugged in her ear. The stock market had dropped another 12 points. I'm starved. Let's sit down to eat. Head held high, Grace Wexler led her husband across the restaurant. All I want is a corned beef sandwich, not a guided tour. Would you prefer to sit alone or with that young lady over there? I thought I was going to sit with you. Please be seated, Grace replied. Jimmy, I mean, Mr. Who will take your order shortly. Jake snatched the menu from his wife and watched her glide. Gracefully, he had to admit. Well, that's a fine kettle of fish, he exclaimed, then turned to his dinner companion. Fine kettle of fish. I'm so hungry, even that sounds good. And from the looks of this menu, that's probably what I'll get. I'm okay, Turtle replied, the final prices of, of actively traded stocks tumbling in her ear. Mr. Who waddled over. I recommend the striped bass. See? What did I tell you? A kettle of fish. Turtle switched off the radio. She had heard enough bad news for one day. How about spare ribs done to a crisp, Who suggested. Then he lowered his voice. What's the point spread of the Packers game? See me later, Jake muttered. Go ahead and tell him, Daddy, Turtle said. I know you're a bookie. Can you stand on your legs? Sidel Pulaski asked. Can you walk at all? 
Hebel never asked Chris those questions. They whispered them to his parents behind his back. No, why? What better disguise for a thief or a murderer than a wheelchair? It's the perfect alibi. Chris enjoyed being taken for the criminal type. Now they really were friends. When you read me notes? What? Oh, read you my notes. Soon, very soon. Sidel daintily touched the corners of her mouth with the napkin, pushed back her chair, and grabbed her polka dot crutch. That was a superb meal. I must give my compliments to the chef. She rose, knocking the chair to the floor, and clumped toward the kitchen door. Where is she going? Angela, starting up to help her partner, was distracted by shouting in the corridor. Hello in there, anybody home? Through the restaurant door came a bundled and booted figure. He danced an elephantine jig, stomping snow on the carpet, flung a long woolen scarf from his neck and yelled, Otis Amber is here, the roads are clear. And that's when the bomb went off. Nobody move, everybody stay where you are. Mr. Who shouted as he rushed into the sizzling, crackling kitchen. Just a little mishap, Grace Wexler explained, taking her command posts in the middle of the restaurant. Nothing to worry about. Eat up before your food gets cold. A cluster of red sparks hissed through the swinging kitchen door, kissed the ceiling, and rained a shimmering shower down and around the petrified hostess. Fireflies of color faded into her honey blonde hair and scattered into ash at her feet. Nothing to worry about, she repeated hoarsely. Just celebrating the Chinese New Year. Otis Amber shouted, adding one of his hee-hee-hee cackles. Mr. Who leaned through the kitchen doorway, his shiny, straight black hair, even shinier and straighter, plastered to his forehead, water dripping down his moon-shaped face. Call an ambulance. There's been a slight accident. Angela dashed past Mr. Who into the kitchen. Jake Wexler made the emergency telephone call and sent Theo to the lobby to direct the ambulance attendants. Why are you standing there like a statue, who shouted at his son? Well, you told everybody to stay where they were, Doug said. Well, you're not everybody. Madam Who tried to make the injured woman as comfortable as possible on the debris strewn floor. Angela found the sequined spectacles, wiped off the wet crystalline mess and placed them on her partner's nose. Don't look so worried, Angela, I'm all right. Sidel was in pain, but she wanted attention on her own terms, not as a hapless, foolish victim of fate. Looks like a fracture, an ambulance attendant said, feeling her right ankle. Careful how you lift her. The secretary suppressed a grunt. It was bad enough being drenched by the overhead sprinkler and draped with noodles. Now they were carrying her right past them all. Grace pulled Angela away from the stretcher. You can visit your friend in a few days. Angela, Angela, Sidel moaned. Pride or not, she wanted her partner at her side. Angela stood between her determined mother and her distraught partner, paralyzed by the burden of choice. Go with your friend, Angie Pye, Jake Wexler said, and other voices chimed in. Go, go with Pulaski. Grace realized she had lost. Perhaps you should go to the hospital, Angela. It's been so long since you've seen your Dr. D. She winked mischievously, but only Flora Bombach smiled back. The policeman and the fire inspector visiting the scene agreed that it was nothing more than a gas explosion. Good thing the sprinkler system worked or Mr. Who might have had a good fire. What kind of fire is a good fire, Who wanted to know. And what about the burglaries, Grace Wexler asked. I'm with the bomb squad, the policeman explained. You'll have to call the robbery detail for that. And what about the coffee shop accident, Theo asked. Also a gas explosion. Jake Wexler asked about the odds of having two explosions in two days in the same building. Ah, nothing unusual, the fireman replied, especially in weather like this. No ventilation, snow packed over the ducts. He instructed the tenants to air out their kitchen before lighting ovens. Mrs. Wexler turned up the heat in her apartment and kept the windows open for the next three days. She did not want anything blowing up during Angela's party. But. The Wexler apartment was exactly where the bomber planned to set the next bomb. And that is the end of chapter 13.
Now don't forget, after you watch this video, to go back to LMS and click on the assignment for a Western Game video and type in there that you have watched the entire video. And then go to the class discussion for Western Game questions chapter 13 and answer those discussion questions. Love you all. Until tomorrow.